Ah. Do you have a remote <laughs> last? <laughs> Are you ready to start again? <laughs> okay, uh, Professor uh, leaves a, sec a third lecture. Shall we start? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me continue uh, my lecture two, uh, even though this is a third lecture. Okay, so in lecture two, um, so let me first briefly uh, review what we learned in the second lecture. So in the second lecture, um, we learned how to define entropy production, so which is a, a logarithmic ratio between time forward and time reverse path probability. And then uh, we um, learned the fluctuation theorem. Actually, uh, the fluctuation theorem means that this average is equal to 1. So because uh, R is equal to um, total entropy production, it means that total entropy production satisfies this fluctuation theorem. And from this fluctuation theorem, we can derive the thermodynamic second law. And of course, uh, there is a freedom to choose the dual um, path to probability. So by choosing some, uh, some useful dual path to probability, then we can show various fluctuation theorems. So the first one was Jasinski equality, and second one is Crookes relation. And then now I will continue to the third one, which is called the hatano sasa fluctuation theorem. Okay, so what is the hatano sasa fluctuation theorem? So it is about the separation of the total entropy into two parts. Okay? So this is a total entropy production, which is given in this way, forward and time reverse path probability. But uh, one natural uh, separation of the total entropy into two parts is that, now we know that, I mean, this is a system entropy change, and this is a uh, reservoir entropy change. So this is a one, I mean, natural uh, separation of the total entropy production into two parts. So, then next question will be like this. Now we know that this to total entropy production satisfies the fluctuation theorem. Then what about these two separated uh, entropy productions? So, uh, this system entropy production satisfies the fluctuation theorem, or this heat satisfies the fluctuation theorem? So, this is the next question. Okay, so let's look at, I mean, step by step. So, um, by definition, this average can be written in this way. So, this is exponential factor, and this is a, a time forward path to probability. And now, here we use this e equation. So, here we plug this equation to this. Then, we can show that uh, this becomes this one. And you, you know, I mean, you see that this is not the path to probability. Uh, so, uh, this is not the normalization condition. It means that this summation is not equal to 1. So, it means that the system entropy production does not satisfy the fluctuation theory. Uh, any question here? Okay. Uh, and then, the second one. So, by definition, so it can be written in this way. So, here this is an exponential part, and this is a path of probability. And now, same thing. By using this equation, so here we plug this equation into this one, and then we can show that uh, this, uh, this becomes this one. So, this is, this is not uh, the, the probability. This is not the path to probability. So uh, the summation over this one, this, doesn't, this is not the normalization condition. So actually, it is not equal to 0. Uh, it is not equal to 1. So it means that this average, also that the heat, does not satisfy the fluctuation theorem either. So 
Um, so this separation actually does not, I mean, there, I mean, the separated these two uh, entropy production uh, do not satisfy the fluctuation theorem separately. Then the next question will be then, is there any um, some clever way uh, such that two separated entropy production entropy productions satisfy the fluctuation theorem simultaneously. So there is a way. So Hatana also found it. Okay, so um, this is a total entropy production. Uh, for example, I mean, this is a total entropy production for Markov jump process. But actually, the, uh, the derivation process is essentially the same for Langevin dynamics. But here, I, I will only focus on the Markov jump process. So this is a total entropy production. And here, we add this term. This term is, it, SS means that uh, this is a, a probability in the steady state. So this is a probability in the steady state. So we add this term. And here, look this. And this is actually the upside down. This is the upside down fleet. So actually, this term is minus this term. So it, 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 it is like a something minus something. So actually, they are canceled out. So these terms are actually a vanishing term. But anyway, we, we add this term and we subtract this term. OK, so here. Uh, we define this first part as a non-idiabatic entropy production. And the second part, we define it as a idiabatic entropy production. And this non-idiabatic entropy production actually is related to the excess heat. And this idiabatic entropy production is related to housekeeping heat. And sometimes this non-idiabatic entropy production is called Hatano Sasa entropy production. Okay, so this is the definitions. And now let's look at whether uh, these two entropy productions satisfy the fluctuation theorem separately. So let's first look at this non idiabatic entropy production. So uh, we can write this term in this way. Actually, this part are same. And this term becomes this one. Here, um, this one, uh, R dega, uh, R dega is defined as uh, this quantity. You see that here, x and x prime order is uh, reversed in x prime x. So there, the order is reversed. So you see that if we plug this equation into this one, and the transition rates are uh, canceled out, and only this ratio, steady state probability ratio remains. So that's why this term is exactly the same as this term. OK, now um, this um, Vega uh, transition rate uh, has a, an important property. So this is it. So uh, this one. It's actually the transition rate of the original dynamics. So the summation over x, actually, this is escape rate of the original dynamics. And you can also show, you can also show that uh, the escape rate of the, um, uh, this Vega dynamics is actually the same as the, that of the original dynamics. You can, you can show easily, I mean, by summing over uh, x here. But anyway, anyway, after the lecture, you, you, can, you can show it. So uh, by using this uh, property, uh, it, so by using uh, this property, we can say, we can say that uh, the same probabilities are same for each transition matrix. So uh, we can now write this uh, non idiabatic entropy production in this logarithmic ratio of uh, uh, these two path probabilities, time forward path probability and time reverse path probability. And uh, not, not the time reverse path probability, but this is kind of a, some dual 
dual path probability, and this dual path probability satisfies the normalization condition. Uh, be because uh, actually the escape rate are same, so the stain probabilities are also same, so they are stain probabilities are cancelled out, so only actually if we calculate this one, then it becomes uh, this, this one. So in, in such a way, we can write the non algebraic entropy production. So because, uh, because of this uh, dual um, path probability satisfies the normalization condition, then uh, the non adiabatic entropy production satisfies the fluctuation theory. So in, in such a way, we can show that this uh, non adiabatic entropy production satisfies the fluctuation theorem, and this is the same for adiabatic part. So this is adiabatic entropy production. Actually, um, you see that uh, this part, uh, this part is actually canceled out, so I mean, this term is actually zero. So uh, if we plug this defi definition into this one, then you can check that uh, this ratio becomes this one, and this uh, two transition matrix ratio becomes this one. So actually, this term and this term are same. And because it has also same property, same escape rate, so we can also write uh, this as a so this as a logarithmic ratio of forward path probability and some kind of a dual path probability. And also, this dual path probability satisfies the normalization condition. So this adiabatic entropy production also satisfies the fluctuation theorem. So the the thing is that. Uh, the total entropy production can be divided into two parts, adiabatic and non-adiabatic entropy production, and each one satisfies the fluctuation theorem. So it tells us that uh, total entropy production has some kind of a hierarchy. Okay, so this is uh, uh, about the hotness of the fluctuation theorem. So here, uh, any questions here? No. How would one measure it Ah, measure. I mean, you mean uh, excessive and housekeeping. And so, it, actually, it, it is not easy to experimentally measure this quantity, but the housekeeping entropy production is actually when in the steady state. In the steady state, actually, the adiabatic entropy production is equal to total entropy production because in, in the Excess entropy is actually the, some uh, entropy necessary for uh, making some uh, system transition. So in the steady state, actually this term goes out and only uh, this adiabatic entropy production term remains. So in, in the steady state, we can easily, I mean, uh, measure the housekeeping here. But in a general case, I mean, it is not easy to measure experimentally. Also, can you explain why this is called non-adiabatic and that is called adiabatic? Uh, actually, um, it is, I mean, this term um, is related to, uh, non-adiabatic. This, the, this, I mean, um, how do I say? <laughs> uh, th this term is related to some some uh, quasi-static, I mean, process uh, in the uh, steady-state process. Actually, it is related to the some steady-state process entropy production. So, I mean, that's why I mean they call it adiabatic entropy production, and because this is not so, they call it non adiabatic entropy production. Um, but that's what I know, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, so any other question? Okay. So, uh, so now I want to show you the expression of entropy production rate. So, I mean, this is different from the entropy production. Entropy production is a total entropy production during finite time, but this is the entropy production rate. 
So um, let's look at the uh, overdent Langevin system first. So this is a Langevin equation, given Langevin equation. And here, uh, this um, stochastic differential equation can be converted to this partial differential equation. And this partial differential equation is called focal Planck equation. And this here, P, is a uh, probability distribution function of x at time t. And this j is a probability current, uh, which is defined in this way. Uh, force f and uh, some temperature and another uh, partial derivative. So probably there may be some, if you are unfamiliar with uh, this focal Planck equation. In, in this lecture, due to the time limit, I cannot explain how this converted into this partial differential equation, but if you are interested in, you can read the book of Riskin, okay? So, but, okay, so here, uh, let, let's, if you don't know what about this, then first let's accept, yeah, that uh, this can be converted into this partial differential equation now. Then, um, uh, the system entropy is given by this Shannon entropy form, K minus KB log uh, this probability density function. So its time derivative can be written in this way. So it can be calculated in this way. And because this total time derivative, because this P is a function of X and T, so by using the chain rule, this is a partial deri derivative of x, partial derivative of t. And as I mentioned, when we um, make a partial, I mean the chain rule for the over to Langevin dynamics, we have to use this Stratonovich product. And here, now by using this equation, we can convert this uh, partial derivative of x of p, we can, we can replace this term by using uh, this formula, okay, from, from this one. So, okay, let me um, arrange the terms. So this, this is the first term, and this is, a, this is a second term, and this last term gives this third term. And here, uh, now we replace this f function by using this equation of motion uh, in terms of x dot and cosy. Then we can replace this f function in this way, and the same thing, same thing. So, and this term, the meaning of this term is actually the uh, heat rate. So, now let's move this term q dot over t, move this term to the left-hand side, then the left-hand side becomes this one, and right-hand side becomes this one. And the meaning of this term is actually the total entropy production rate. Okay? So it means that the total entropy production rate is expressed in this way. So, the average value of this total entropy production rate can be written in this way. And the meaning of this average value is this one, average over the, this probability density function. So let's calculate this average first. Then uh, from, from this definition, it can be written in this way. And because this integration is nothing but a normalization condition, so it is simply one. So the time derivative of uh, this uh, one is just simply zero. So it means that this second term vanishes. And now I will use some general, um, quant general um, equation, relation, so, I mean, for general function g, then g uh, multiplied by x dot 
and here the, uh, the product is Stratonovich. So this average can be, uh, we can show that this average is equal to this integration, g times, uh, g times this j, the probability current j, and integration over all uh, position. Then it is, and they are saying, we can show that. Uh, in the next slide, I, there is a derivation in the next slide. So anyway, at, at this point, let's use this equation, relation. Then we can, um, and we can as and we can calculate this average by using this equality. So this is it. So this is a p uh, j square over p, okay, and integration over I mean whole range of x. So this is an expression. This is expression of entropy production rate in the overdental Langevin system, okay. And for under dental Langevin system, the expressions are almost same, uh, except uh, except uh, instead of this J, uh, we have to replace J into uh, irreversible current. I mean, so the same form but a, a little bit uh, different function. But uh, you don't you don't care about that anyway. So almost almost similar uh, functional form. And then I will use uh, this um, expression to derive uh, uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relations. So please um, memorize this form. OK. Um, and this is a derivation of this relation. But uh, due to the time limit, so if you are interested in, then you can read my lecture notes. So here, I will skip, skip this. OK, then what is the expression for entropy production rate for uh, the Markov jumper process. So, I mean, in this case, it is easy to find the entropy production rate expression because in the Markov jumper process, entropy is produced only when jump occurs. When it stays at the same state, then actually no entropy product, at no entropy is produced. So only, only when jump occurs, entropy is produced. So let's say that jump from y state to x state, uh, let's say that this jump occurs. Uh, so uh, the during time t, uh, so, so when, when this, um, OK, so when this jump occurs once, then the probability observing this jump from y state to x state uh, is given by this way and the time reverse path pro time reverse path probability is given in this way so the logarithmic ratio gives the entropy production uh, induced by this jump during time delta t but this delta t are same so actually we can write in this way and, total, and the number of jumps from y to x during delta t is given by this way. So uh, the, the entropy production, total entropy production during delta t is given in that way. So the entropy production rate divided by delta t and time goes to delta t goes to zero limit, then it becomes a, uh, the entropy production rate so it can be written in this way. So this is a, a entropy production rate expression in the Markov jumper process. Okay. So okay. So uh, this is a summary of the whole lecture two. So I now I, I just talked about the Hatano Sasa entropy production. So the entropy can be divided into two parts and each one satisfy the fluctuation theorem separately. And then this is an entropy production rate expression for lungs over dental lungs of dynamics. And this is an expression of entropy production rate for Markov jump process. OK, so um, I, I'll, I'll use I mean, these two expressions uh, later. So uh, OK, so. 
Now let's turn to my lecture three, originally lecture three. Okay, so I will skip this summary. Okay, so let's summarize what we have learned up to this point by using this schematic uh, of stochastic system. So um, there is a uh, stochastic system, and let's say that t zero, this is the initial time, and this is the final time tau. And this is the initial state, and this is the final state, x1 prime. And gamma 1 is a one single stochastic trajectory. And there are many, um, there are many initial states, there are many final states. So this initial state constitutes this initial distribution and final states constitute final distribution, and there are many uh, stochastic trajectories. So here, um, we are interested in measuring absor some observable theta. Of course, this theta is a function of uh, trajectory gamma. So for example, in lecture one, uh, we learned how to define heat and how to define work, or theta can be displacement. So they are uh, actually the observables we are interested in. And one special observable is entropy production. So entropy production is also a function of uh, gamma a trajectory. So we learned this entropy production in lecture two. So the, in the first lecture, I, I mentioned that the thermodynamics is uh, physics, which is about uh, the relation, uh, which is about to study relations uh, between some these observables. So, question, uh, so the important question for this stochastic system is that, is there any general relation for entropy production and this measurable observables. So in lecture two, as a one important relation, uh, we learned this fluctuation theorem. Uh, here, uh, from, from the lecture three, uh, I, I, will have, I will use this notation sigma uh, instead of a delta as total. I mean, for, for simplicity. So, I mean, this uh, sigma now means the total entropy production from, from the lecture three. So, um, in lecture two, uh, I talked about the fluctuation theorem. This is a, an important relation for entropy production. And this is, a, okay, so by using the Johnson's inequality, we can derive this thermodynamic second law. And so it can, be, it can be called as a generalized second law. This is what we learned in lecture two. So uh, by choosing uh, the dual dynamics, we can uh, derive many other fluctuation theorems, Jajinsky equality, Crookes fluctuation theorem, Hatanosasa fluctuation theorem, and information fluctuation theorem. Even though I did not talk about this information fluctuation theorem, and uh, I mean, Tadairo will uh, talk about this information fluctuation theorem in his lecture. Okay, and then the second relation uh, is about thermodynamic, this is called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, and shortly we, so we call this TUR. And TUR is a relation uh, between entropy production and observable. So what is TUR? So TUR looks like this. Fluctuation theorem is equality, is given by equality, but TUR is given by inequality. So it looks like this, and this is a variance of observable. So this, this term is called relative fluctuation, and this is entropy production average, and this KB is Boltzmann constant. So what it means? So let me give you an example. 
So here, let's say that uh, observable here, let's say that we set theta as a displacement of this uh, molecular motor. Of course, because of this, uh, the stochasticity, x variable is a stochastic variable. So it will have some kind of a distribution, and it will have some finite variance. OK, so here, sometimes we want to reduce this relative fluctuation. For example, let's say that we want to this relative fluctuation, make this relative fluctuation 0. But if we want to decrease this term as a 0, then from this inequality, the entropy production should be infinity. Uh, so it means that if we want to reduce this relative fluctuation, then entropy production should be increased. And if we want to decrease this entropy production, then relative fluctuation should increase. So it means that this TUR is kind of a trade-off relation between the relative fluctuation and entropy production. And entropy production is, we can understand that it is a thermodynamic cost. So we have to pay thermodyna more thermodynamic cost for reducing fluctuation. This is the meaning of this uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relation. OK? And if we rearrange this thermodynamic uncertainty relation, then we can have this relation. Then you see that the thermodynamic second law uh, just tells us that entropy production is larger than 0. But this TUR tells us that entropy production is larger than some positive value. So, this is the Im so it means that TUR gives us a stronger bound than the thermodynamic second law. And this is an importance of TUR in theoretical viewpoint. OK, so uh, up to now, clear. OK. So uh, in lecture three, I'll talk about, I'll talk about uh, TUR. So in the first section, I'll talk about how to derive TUR. Uh, so for over the Langerbank system and for Markov jump process. And in the second section, uh, I'll talk about how to apply this TUR to our uh, some experimental system. OK. So this is a brief um, history of a TUR a discovery. So it was first reported in 2015, so seven years ago, very recent one. And here, what I mean by report is that uh, in this paper, actually, they discover. I mean, discover this TUR, but they couldn't uh, derive. They couldn't prove it. In the one year later, uh, this group uh, uh, first derived this TUR by using large deviation theory. We learned this large deviation theory in the, uh, in the morning by Vipul's lecture. And then 2018, uh, this Japanese group derived TUR by using generating function method. And the next year, uh, 2019, uh, this group uh, derived TUR by using kramer rao inequality. And this kramer rao inequality, I mean, this is very I mean, famous inequality in information science. So it looks like this. And here, um, I, I uh, is means Fisher information, and this is a variance. And okay, so this kramer rao inequality greatly simplifies the TUR derivation. So uh, I will skip uh, all this uh, uh, derivation, but I only focus on this kramer rao inequality derivation. Okay, then. What is the Kramer-Rao Kram inequality? So uh, here, uh, let's say that there is a, some general uh, observable theta. And theta is a function of z. And, and there is a, some, some probability distribution, which is also a function of z. And this is parameterized by 
some parameter epsilon. It means that p also depend p also depends on uh, epsilon. And here, so the this bracket epsilon means that average over this distribution. So if I write in this way, that it means that the observable average in in the, by using this uh, uh, probability distribution. Okay. So now let's look at uh, uh, this one. So this is an observable average and partial derivative of epsilon, n square. So uh, by using this, we can write in this way. Because theta has no dependence on epsilon, so this partial derivative only applies to this probability distribution and total square, right? And then here, um, here, let's look at this note. So now let's consider this um, term. And because this part is already integrated our z uh, variable, so actually it, it has nothing to do with this integration. So it is kind of a constant, so we can um, take this term out of this integration. Then the remaining term can be written in this way. And because this is simply one, because this is a normalization condition, so this partial derivative is simply zero. So actually this term uh, look, a little bit looks complicated, but actually this is just a zero number. So here we just uh, add this zero number here. So these are same, same one. And then here we bind these two quantity uh, with this uh, common factor in this way. And here this one can be rewritten in this way. And so uh, by using this equality and now this equation can be uh, uh, written in this way. So now I will use the cauchy schwarz inequality. cauchy schwarz inequality is uh, something that it is about the, if there is a two vector and this vector product square is smaller than each vector square product, right? So, I mean, cauchy schwarz is uh, essentially the same as this one. So, in this quantity, I mean, there are two, I mean, two vector. I mean, if, if let's say that this is a vector and this is a c vector, then this a vector square and this is c vector square. So, we can, we can separate in this way and this product, this two product is larger than uh, this one. This is a cauchy schwarz inequality. If you are not familiar with this cauchy schwarz inequality, then you can, uh, late after the lecture, then you can, I mean, you can sit, sit in your chair and then you can, I mean, follow, you can follow this line. So, uh, this first term is nothing but a variance of theta. And the second term, we can rewrite this integrand in this way. Because this is a square, so we write second time and distribution. And by using uh, this equality, now we change this term into this one. So uh, this can be written in this way. And here we use uh, integration by parts. So uh, here, uh, this, uh, we move this partial integration in front of this one and take a minus sign. Then it becomes this one. So this is the integration by parts. And this one is, so we can write, this is an average of this integrand, right? So we can write in this way. So here we define and this average value is equal to Fisher information. So this is the definition of Fisher information. So 
this I mean this equation can be written simply written in this way so variance times Fisher information and you see that this variance times Fisher information is larger than this value so rearranging the terms so we now finally have this Cromer-Rao inequality okay this is the derivation I mean mm, this is a derivation for this Cromer-Rao inequality so this Cromer-Rao inequality holds for any observable any probability distribution this is a very general um, inequality so now I will use this Cromer-Rao inequality to the stochastic thermodynamic system so let's consider there is a, some original dynamics over the Entelang-Japan system here the external force is uh, F here and now in this original dynamics I will add some perturbation force so here uh, the perturbation force is epsilon G of X the G of X can be any arbitrary perturbation force and here so you can regard this epsilon as a perturbation uh, parameter so small number epsilon is a small number so when epsilon goes to zero limit then this perturbed dynamics returns back to the original dynamics so in so so when you now think of this Cromer Rao inequality then uh, you can regard this epsilon as a some perturbation parameter now from now on because uh, I mean it, it, it always I mean hold for any observable any probability distribution any epsilon and so so now from now on I will consider some observable uh, which is a function of gamma instead of Z and I'll consider path probability which is a function of gamma also and because we are now considering this perturbed dynamics so this path probability also depends on epsilon because this holds for any theta any probability uh, density function so I mean it also holds for this observable and path probability so now uh, take a epsilon goes to zero limit it means that uh, so we evaluate the Cromero Rao inequality at this original dynamics limit then it, it will becomes like this then here let's compare this Cromero Rao inequality and this TUR then you see that there is a similarity right so if this one this one and this one so these three relations are satisfied then actually this Cromero Rao inequality is exactly the same as a TUR okay so and the first relation is actually automatically true so we don't care about this first relation and actually this second relate I mean second and third relation so by choosing some uh, by choosing some proper perturbation force g of x so by choosing this uh, proper function uh, function gx if we can show these two relations are satisfied then we can derive this TUR from this Cramer Rao inequality we already we already derived this Cramer Rao inequality so if we only show these two relations by choosing some proper g of x then we can show this uh, TUR so this is a basic strategy to derive TUR by using Cramer Rao inequality okay then the remaining task is that what kind of perturbation leads to these two relations we have to find such a perturbation force okay so there are many I mean I think uh, there will be there will be many uh, possible uh, trials but one intuitive one is like this so this is an observable average in the perturbed dynamics and this is an observable average in the original dynamics so if these two averages have this relation 
then the first relation is automatically true. Right? This is a trivial. So what kind of perturbation leads to uh, this relation? So from now on, uh, for simplicity, I will only, only focus on steady state. Okay, so in the steady state, we can define the steady state rate. So let's say that this is theta dot steady state means that this is a observable rate. Then uh, the total, I mean the accumulated observable in the steady state is simply given by multiplying by total time tau times rate, right? So here, now, here we make this time scaling perturbation. It means that time is scaled by this quantity, 1 plus epsilon quantity. Here, epsilon is a small number. Then, total time is also scaled by the same factor. Because the total time is increased, so the total accumulated average observable is scaled by the same factor, right? So it means that in the steady state, if we make this scaling perturbation, then this relation holds. Then the first relation can be satisfied. Okay, so the remaining task we have to do is that if we make this scaling perturbation, then what is the value of this Fisher information? It is really the same as the uh, total entropy production. So if it is so, then we can derive uh, the, the TUR. Okay, so let's check it. Okay, so this is uh, original dynamics. And the original dynamics Foucault-Planck equation, as I mentioned, that uh, we can write this Foucault-Planck equation. Actually, they are same uh, dynamics. So here, let's make this time scaling perturbation. So instead of t, we put 1 plus epsilon t. Here, 1 plus epsilon t. And this 1, one plus epsilon comes from the derivative of this time. Okay. Now, let's consider only the steady state. Then, the, in the steady state, actually, uh, the, the probability density function uh, does not, uh, no longer depends on time. So actually, we can just write the steady state in this way. And in the partial derivative of this steady state probability density function, it is simply zero because it does not change in time. So the re remaining thing is this one. And, and one, one important thing is that in this, I mean, the steady state solution of this perturbed dynamics is the same as the original dynamics steady state uh, distribution. OK, so um, this one is a, a probability density function of the original dynamics. So we can rewrite this term into this way. This is nothing but this first part comes from this one factor, and this second part comes from this epsilon factor by definition of this probability current. And then here I insert this term into this parenthesis. Then we can write function in this way. Okay? I mean, this term and this term are same, same one. So now let's define this function as g function, g of x, in this way. Then let's look at, I mean, now this uh, focal Planck equation in the steady state. Then the corresponding Langevin dynamics of this focal Planck equation is this one. Right, so it means that I started from this time scaling perturbation, but come to a conclusion that actually this time scaling perturbation is equivalent to the, this perturbed dynamics in the steady state. 
so this is a point. Okay, so okay, so now we have uh, this perturbed dynamics, and the function of g of x looks like this. So now, because now we are now we know the what is a perturbation force, and we can now calculate the Fisher information. So this is a path of probability. So we know how to write the path of probability for this perturbed dynamics. So uh, this is it. And here I used the, the product notation, the e to product, for for convenience. So. Uh, we can, uh, so by plugging this equation to here, actually this term and this term does not have any epsilon dependence. So because of this second derivative of epsilon, so actually these two terms uh, goes away. So we don't care about these two terms. So only remaining term, re remaining part is this one. So this is it. Now we expand this square in this way. So this is, so this term square, and this term square, and their cross product becomes this one. And because this is an eta product, so actually this is a just a normal product. And look at this second partial derivative of epsilon. Then if it applies to this one. Actually, this is vanishes because there is no epsilon dependence. This also vanishes because it only has a linear dependence. So the remaining term is only this one. This has a second I and mean, a square term, epsilon square term. So only this term remains uh, by using this uh, applying this second derivative. So the result is this one. And now we know what is g function. G function is given in this way. So if we plug in this equation into this one, and then uh, now and, and evaluate this average value, then it becomes uh, this one. So probably you are, uh, I mean, familiar, kind of familiar with this expression. Uh, we previously, I mean, learned this expression is an expression for entropy production rate. Okay, so so the entropy production rate and integration over from zero time to tau, then actually this term is nothing but total entropy production. So what we show is that this Fisher information uh, is equal to the entropy production. So it means that this relation, I mean, now is satisfied. So. Uh, Case. So by making the time uh, perturbation, by making the time scaling scale perturbation, so uh, it satisfies these two relations. So because of these two, because now these three relations are satisfied, so we derive uh, the TUR. Okay. So this is the uh, derivation we have to how to derive TUR. Okay, so you, you, are you now following me? So is there any question up to this point? I mean, you, you can check by yourself uh, by reading my um, lecture note, but the, the important thing is that the, some big, big picture, how to derive a TUR. So to derive TUR, we use this kramer rao inequality, and by using the time scaling perturbation, then we can show uh, these three relations are satisfied. In such a way, we can derive TUR. This is a, some, some whole picture, big picture of this derivation. OK. Can, can you, my, my microphone, can you? Uh, thank you. So um, maybe you will cover this in the following but uh, the question arises, uh, uh, since the kramer rao and the Fisher information come from uh, essentially developing to second order close to a certain 
probability distribution. One might wonder whether there exists a sort of a higher order, nonlinear, monolinear expressions of this. Y yes, right. I mean, as I said, uh, 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 this is uh, um, actually when epsilon goes to zero, then it, it, the feature information is order of epsilon square. So, I mean, so this derivation is, uh, we call this a uh, linear perturbation, uh, there, I mean, the inequality, but we can also uh, find more higher order inequality, yes, as you said. It, it, it is possible, and for example, uh, 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 I don't, I, <laughs> I forget his name. Uh, the Varadhan, Dunsko Varadhan inequality. So such a such an inequality is ki kind of such higher order um, inequality. So uh, is this T R is only valid for non equilibrium steady state, or it's it can be it can be valid for the time dynamic equation also means. Yes, a very important question. So to derive. To derive this TUR, uh, it should be steady state, non-equilibrium steady state. Then, then, then the next question will be like this. Then what happens if the system is not in the steady state? So for example, non-steady non state situation, then in such a case, uh, this TUR form uh, is changed a little bit. I I'll show you later okay. how to change. Okay. Oh. Oh, in the proof, it seems that the TUR is a special case of taking special perturbation function. Mm -hmm. Then I wonder uh, why, why we use TUR rather than the left-hand side of that arrow. Ah, so yeah, I mean, y your question is that we can also use this inequality. Why, why we have to use this one? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right. Uh, that's a good question. But uh, in experiment, so let's let's we do some experiment. Then, uh, the measuring the average of some observable, I think, are easier than to get this some partial partial uh, some. Different, yeah. So, uh, in, in such a way, it, directly using this inequality is um, difficult in experiment. So that's why we want to use just uh, this uh, average value, not uh, the derivative value. Because if, if we get this number, then we have to change the perturbation force a little bit, and then we have to calc I mean, we have to evaluate this one from the uh, experiment, but it, it is not easy matter, so that's why. <coughs> Thank you. And, uh, and of course, the g of x function, the perturbation function is a quite um, fictitious function. It is not real function. I mean, fictitious because uh, it looks like very strange way. I mean, it, the form is actually we have to understand the what is the prob and the steady state the probability density function. So it is not easy to experimentally apply this kind of a force to the experiment. So it is not an easy matter. Can I ask one more question? Uh, then uh, is there any other perturbation function G that uh, makes some inequality of entropy production rate? Um, I cannot say this is a unique way because I, I don't, I have do not try all possible perturbation force, but I think uh, it is almost, uh, almost unique way to derive because uh, we know what is the expression for, yeah, I mean, we, we know what is the expression of uh, entropy production rate. So to derive such expression, then I think uh, the possible 
trial function, I think it, it should be very limited. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay, so is there any other question? Okay. Okay, so um, this is a derivation of TOR for over for Langerbank dynamics. And let's turn to the, then how to derive the UR for Markov jump a process. But strategy is simply same. So we will use this time scaling perturbation. So if we make this time scaling perturbation in the steady state, then this is automatically holds. So the first relation is automatically true. So the remaining, remaining thing is that, so by using this scaling perturbation, when we calculate this Fisher information, which is really gives this total entropy production. We have to, so the remaining point we have to check is uh, this second relation. Okay, so uh, this is a original dynamics. This is original master equation. So here, let's make it this time scaling perturbation. So instead of t, we put at one plus epsilon t. One plus epsilon t here and there. And this one plus epsilon originate from uh, this, uh, this t. So in the steady state, uh, this simply becomes zero. And this one actually does not depend on time in the steady state, so we can write in this way. And this one plus epsilon terms uh, come into this summation, so we can write in this way. And here, let's, okay, so this is the same one, same one, but here, let's subtract this value and add this value. And you see that the denominators are same and the numerator are also same. So it means that minus something plus something. So actually they vanishes. Actually this is a zero. So here we define this function as eta xy then because this y x and x y is uh, reversed so if if it is eta x y then it is eta y x so uh, now add this term and this term then this term addition of this term gives uh, this first part and addition of this term, this term gives the second part. Okay, so, I mean, these two um, master equations are equivalent to one. But uh, looks like different, but they are equivalent, actually. So, so we can write, uh, in general way, we can write this master equation in this way. So here now, uh, transition rate depends on epsilon. So in, in this case, transition rate, transition rate is this one. And in this case, transition rate is this one. So in general way, we can write the transition rate in this way. So here, when delta equal to zero, actually it becomes this one. And when delta equal to one, and it becomes this one. Probably you are wondering why <laughs> they are same, but you, we have this kind of uh, strange things, but you, you can see why later. So it means that this time scaling perturbation is equivalent to this, this perturbed dynamics. Here, the transition matrix is perturbed by the factor of epsilon. Okay, so with this perturbed transition matrix, now let's evaluate this Fisher information. So this is a definition of Fisher information. And then 
to evaluate this fissure information, we have to write the path probability of this Markov jump process. And so the, the change is nothing but the absolute, I mean, this transition matrix depends on epsilon. And here, now let's look at this two, I mean, the whole stain probability. And we can write this whole stain probability in this way. So here, x of t uh, denotes the state at time t. So um, this delta function uh, picks uh, the state uh, at time t. So we, we, can, we can write this whole stain probability in this way. And uh, this transition part. So transition part can be written, be written in this way. So actually, this term comes from this logarithmic function. And there is a, some m dot xy, m xy dot here. So m xy dot means that actually here uh, t xy means that time at which transition from y to x occurs. So this delta function picks the time at which uh, some transition occurs. So, uh, so it only counts uh, when the transition occurs. So actually, these two expressions are the same. So anyway, we can rewrite this path of probability by using this delta function and this m, fun m dot function. And the thing is that the average value of this delta function is equal to the probability. And this m dot xy, it, this picks the transition time. So actually, this average value is equal to uh, this value, number of transition per, during, uh, during, uh, per, per unit time. OK, so okay, so I mean, anyway, this is an expression uh, rewritten of uh, the previously known probability, uh, path probability. OK, so um, now let's calculate this Fisher information. And because uh, actually this term uh, does not have any epsilon dependence, so we, we can ignore this term because uh, there is a second derivative of epsilon here. So the remaining part is given in that way. So second derivative applies to this first part, and the second derivative applies to this second part. And we know that from the definition of this uh, r epsilon, this is a linear function in epsilon. So it means that this second derivative of this actually vanishes. So we don't, we don't need to care about this. So the only the remaining term is this one, second term. So if we take this second derivative, if we calculate this second derivative, then the result uh, looks like this. And for the same reason, this is second derivative of r epsilon, this is vanishes. And the remaining term is only this term. And we can explicitly calculate uh, this part because uh, this is, I mean, linear in epsilon. So this, uh, uh, the, the first derivative of epsilon, which gives only this part. Okay, so this is the result. And this term is canceled out. So only the remaining part is this one. Okay, so uh, we, we obtain the expression for Fisher information. So when delta equal to zero, when delta equal to zero, then this term is uh, neglected, and only only this term is re uh, only this term remains. 